Welcome to episode three of this Rule the Wave 3 playthrough as Germany, starting in 1935. And we're still in 1935. There's a lot to do. In the previous episode, we spent a fair bit of time preparing the fleet for our game. And this episode, we're going to finish off that process by concentrating on uh, dealing with the wider navy. Starting off the game is such a complicated process that I created a little bit of a uh, to-do list for both the fleet and for the Navy. And the good news is we got through quite a lot of those in episode two. So now we're just going to have a look at our various priorities. We're going to have a little look at the aircraft types and air basing and review our coastal batteries. And then if that doesn't all take too long, we'll actually get going with the game or maybe leave that to episode four. Research, first of all. It's important when you start at a place like 1935 to understand that you are a long way through the game, specifically 324 research breakthroughs across all of these different topics, many of which only have appeared during the game. The uh, list of topics that you start with in 1890 or indeed in 1900, is a lot smaller. I think by 1920, all of these are out. And as you can see, each has a variable number of achievements, research breakthroughs that we've done. I've listed out the most recent, most recent notable. So machinery is consistently a bunch of weight savings. Great weight savings, you know, 1% each time. After 23, it all adds up. Armor usually is qualitative improvements. The hull are further weight savings. Damage control, uh, the little dagger there represents, this is a German advantage. Um, we're strangely behind on only 17. And again, it's an incremental process. And then ship design. I've, by the way, I've rearranged them from how they appear in the game because this makes more sense. The ship design, we can have triple turrets on anything, uh, and we uh, most recently were able to have an all forward armament. In the light forces, we have improved motor torpedo boats. Not specified exactly what the improvement is, but they're there. And we can build 2,500 ton destroyers. I think our current biggest destroyer is only 1,500 tons. So that's a very substantial leap in capability and I will need to get on with that. At least I fall behind the uh, destroyer race. Torpedoes, we can have oxygen torpedoes and we can have centerline torpedo tubes on ships up to 3,500 tons. Submarines can do night surface attacks. Um, most of the improvements are around reliability, but reliability now is really high, like 97% or something like that. Anti-submarine warfare improved hydrophones and the convoy system. So you'll note no active sonar, though that needs to be a priority along with damage control. Airships, another German advantage, has night operations plus helium plus uh, parasite fighters. Um, in my previous playthrough, parasite fighters did at least shoot down at least one uh, aeroplane. Aircraft themselves, heavier than air, Again, night operations and bombers, it says. I think that means torpedo bombers uh, or possibly medium. And air launch torpedoes. We ought to have torpedo bombers. We don't. I expect them to appear in, uh, in, a, in a month or two. And aircraft operations. So deck edge lifts and a deck park, making your carrier operations much more sophisticated. And the operation of uh, or the opportunity to build large carriers. Armor-piercing projectiles, another German advantage, and now have diving shells. So deck armor becomes more important, as well as improvements in oblique penetration. So to counter the development of inclined armor. Explosive shells, improved heavy anti-aircraft, and generally this is around increased shell damage. Fire control, we're up to an advanced director. I think, although it's 24, and uh, joint number one, I wonder if that's a bit behind, but perhaps, perhaps I'm wrong. Turrets, 
mainly rate of fire improvements and weight savings again. Naval guns, harder to know what the most recent naval gun, but our naval guns for Germany, I feel, aren't great. 15 inch is quality zero, 12 and 11 inch quality one, then the rest are all again quality zero until you get the sort of five inch quality ones. And people's operations, only four. It's not as a crucial thing for us, but you know, it needs to come along. And finally, fleet tactics, I believe, is low and needs to be addressed. Fleet tactics comes along in about 1902 or something and has critical uh, advances that allows you to deploy your formations much more flexibly. Flexible station keeping helps defensively resist hits from planes and, and gunfire by allowing ships not to be in such rigid line ahead. Voice radio uh, improves the distance with which you can control ships. And of course, we can have a carrier force as well as a scouting force, as well as a battle line. So that's where we're up to now. Let's have a look at what we want to emphasize. So here is the game. Here is the research. I'm just going to zoom in. I like to play with everything set to zero because the priority is a relative. So if you set everything to high, that's exactly the same setting everything to low and it's pointless. So if you set everything to low, then you can cherry pick one or two things that you believe should be high and a few things that can be medium and they'll really stand out much better. So from this lot, we definitely said that this is potentially underdone, the uh, damage control and subdivision, the anti-submarine warfare, is also underdone. The heavier than air aircraft is also a high priority. I would think also fleet tactics, maybe medium anti-aircraft artillery, certainly high. Shipboard aircraft operations, certainly medium. We, I think we've had the most important ones, but it's good to keep it up. And guns. And I think that will do for now. Let me know if you think I'm missing any that really ought to be a priority. By default, the research budget is 8%. It can go up to 10% without penalty uh, is kind of the optimal. It can go up to 12%, but apparently you get into diminishing returns, although they don't make clear what those diminishing returns might be. I did do an analysis of all of the researches that were in the Ruler Waves 2 in towards the end, the last few episodes of my France 1920 game series. And uh, one thing I learned is they all don't have the same number. So it's not like they all have, I don't know, 28 researches and you have to get to the top. The number of them uh, vary considerably. That will do for research. Let's go and have a look at doctrine. Now, the ammunition usage doctrine is something I don't tend to muck about with. If you've made this a particular specialization of yours, please drop a comment in and uh, share your advice. Equally, the ammunition loadout, I tend not to mess about with. I do, however, get very interested in this stuff down the side. So starting from the bottom, run the Naval Academy. Yes, cost 180. It will have an impact on officers and potentially wider impacts that I'm not aware of. Next one is use oxygen fueled torpedoes on destroyers. Well, yes, yes, thank you very much. And on cruisers, yes. I mean, since we have them, um, it increases the range and speed, but risks extra damage if the tubes are hit. Yeah. So actually, I'll take that off the cruisers because intrinsically the cruisers are much more expensive. Um, the heavy cruisers cost as much as a, uh, as a small battleship. The use of scout force. 
I'm going to keep this on um, yes at the moment fairly soon. I believe that it will be redundant, um, particularly once I deploy a carrier force, but I haven't got a carrier, so just for now, that's fine. Float plane, helicopter, search priority, yes. So get them to do the scouting before you send planes off your carriers to do the scouting. Elite pilot training, sounds like a wonderful thing. It will improve their skill, but also I think improve their cost. Use diving shells. Well, yes, since again, we've developed them, that would seem to be a good thing to do. And then you have these four training priorities. You can get good at gunnery, which costs quite a bit, but will give you a bonus in your shooting. You can get good at night fighting, you can get good at torpedo warfare, and you can get good at damage control. So the bottom three all cost 20% increase in maintenance. The gunnery will cost 30. Out of these four, you can pick any two, but it costs a lot. Obviously, historically, the Germans liked damage control in particular as a thing. You know, so long as the ships floated, that was, that was a good route. Float fight maneuver, I think, was an axiom within the Royal Navy as well. So I'm happy to apply that. It takes a year for the training to come through. Annoyingly, if you stop this training, the bonus that you get instantly stops. It's not like it degrades gently. Okay. Peacetime missile storage is useful as well. Plentiful, adequate, and minimum. Well, we haven't got any missiles. But that's a, a new addition for Rule the Ways 3, as well as the uh, torpedo usage and the Naval Academy and the damage control as a training priority. Okay, well, that's fine for that. Intelligence priority. So I'm going to put low for the Soviet Union and low for France. You'll notice they both have asterisks next to them. This is because it takes a while for the intelligence effort to kick in. So you'll get a reduced level of intelligence until that asterisk disappears. I'll increase the low to a medium once it becomes clear who is going to be the next likely enemy. I'm not putting it against the Japanese because doing intelligence aggravates and I don't want to aggravate the Japanese in any way whilst they're building the graph Spey. And for the rest, meh, not really that super interested just for now. So that's the three priorities, research, doctrine, and intelligence. We've already done the dock size building. So the next thing is to go and have a little look at our aircraft. So let me zoom out and bring this to the fore. We have five aircraft types. They, as I've said in the previous episode, they don't have the capabilities that you'd commonly think of because we're much more familiar with Spitfires and BF-109s and Mustangs and the like. So a 1935 fighter, still a biplane. R1 has 192 knots maximum speed and only 145 nautical mile range. This is why in episode two, I did a comparison of trying to hit with airstrikes or sail up and attack with gunnery a fleet 125 nautical miles away. In eight years or so, this will probably double both the speed and the, uh, the range. Not to mention a greatly increased firepower, so it only has a firepower of 2, toughness of 7, and maneuverability of 11. I've included that because dive bombers are often kind of secondary-like fighters. So its maximum speed is almost identical to the fighter. We may need to investigate having a new fighter. Its range is actually considerably greater. Its firepower is the same, its toughness is the same, and it's only in maneuverability that it loses out. 
Aside from this secondary fighter capability, it's often the plane that gets most commonly used for scouting if you don't have enough float planes to do the scouting. However, its day job is to be a dive bomber, and it can take a heavy load of 600 pound bomb and take that out to 128 nautical miles. Really not very far. We currently don't have a torpedo bomber in service, but this year I hope that will be corrected. Medium bomber of uh, 144 knots cruise speed. For the uh, other um, bombers, I'm really more interested in their cruise speed, how long it will realistically take them to get to uh, a set distance. Um, for people more familiar with miles an hour, that's 165. 650 nautical mile maximum range with a light bomb load. More firepower, less tough. So they are vulnerable to both fighters and dive bombers. However, its day job is having a heavy bomb load of 2,000 pounds and taking that out to 400 nautical miles. Our float plane has a cruise speed of 89 nautical miles an hour just toddling along, and a range of 128 nautical miles. It's difficult within the constraints of a float plane that has to be launched off a ship via a catapult and contain either a great big hull, like the, uh, I think this is a seagull here, the uh, aeroplane before the Royal Navy's walrus, or they have great big floats either hanging off their wings, huge amounts of drag. So Getting much extra performance out of float planes is, is quite difficult, but they do gradually get better. And finally, a, uh, a naval patrol aircraft. They are really ponderous. I mean, better than the float plane, but for similar reasons, because they themselves are float planes, only 110 nautical miles an hour cruising. 385 nautical miles an hour maximum range compared to the medium bomber, that's very low, and so that definitely needs improvement. Uh, tough as old boots, though. Five firepower and 12 toughness. You're not going to take these down too bad. Really, the 385 maximum range is their primary objective, but when required to be uh, bombers, they can do a fair job at 1,600 pounds heavy bomb load and 282 nautical miles with a heavy bomb load range. So definitely a new patrol aircraft is warranted. Happy with the medium bomber. Definitely a new fighter to bring this speed up. <laughs> it's faster than the dive bomber. The torpedo bomber, as I say, I expect to come uh, along as a new research very soon. And the float plane could uh, deal with a lift because this 128 nautical mile range is not good enough, really. We need it to be somewhere near 100, for example. I've represented the aircraft just like this because often I feel that the normal rule of waves way of doing this, let me just zoom in, is um, actually quite hard to read sometimes. I've decided to have a new naval patrol aircraft because I'm very concerned that this range is far too short and I would love it if we developed a new one with a much expanded range. Yes, the fighter will probably be my second priority and then we'll revisit where we are after that, probably the torpedo bomber when that becomes available. Okay, let's have a look at the air groups. As you can see, the these figures here, the 32 is how many aeroplanes are actually on the base. For some strange reason, Rule of Waves has a default where it equips each base with fewer aircraft than actually it can use. So with these tens, you can see I've asked it to increase the number of these aircraft to 10 each. And I've already asked to expand the airbase at Kiel to 40, which is the same as everybody else. That's fine. However, if we go to the base overview, we can see that First of all, all of these air bases can be 
expanded. So let's crack on with that. You'll also notice we have no airships. Surely that's wrong. Bangzig, I'm going to build an airbase, airship base to cover the uh, Baltic. And at Tonda, which is sort of just under the border with Denmark, uh, I'll also build uh, an airship base. That will be enough. We then have these other laces like Dangzig, which won't let me have an airbase. Like Riga and Raval and Liblau. Hmm. I wonder why Dangzig won't let me build an airbase there. Curious. Everywhere else, we're building some air bases or expanding the current air bases. That will give us a major lift in air base capacity. It will also obviously make this lot all more expensive. So I'm going to pop them into reserve. Their experience is already poor, so we're not wasting any experience from that. And we will OK that. And that looks fine for now in terms of the air bases. But since we are here, we can also, ah, I lied. There's also here and here in East Germany. We can not improve uh, the batteries at the base level. That has to be done in the area level. So the first thing to note is that in the Baltic, we have none. So let's build some fortifications. I'm going to build a set of four inches and I'm going to say build four of them. I'm then going to build um, six inches and we'll give two of them and then Finally, we're going to build some MTB squadrons. And again, we'll have two of them. We go to Quest of Fortifications. Yep, there they all are uh, under construction. It's going to take quite a bit of money, but it's kind of a one time deal. And whilst we're at it, in Germany itself, I'm probably not going to bother with MTBs. And in East Prussia, oh, actually it's, yes. So currently there's nothing in East Prussia. So I will build some batteries there. Let's build three, four inch. They won't really affect the naval battles particularly, but they will increase the number of minefields. And we're also going to give it an MTB squadron two. That is a fair amount of construction as well as our new Staffenborg uh, to complement the Graf's Bay, as well as our study for the Columbia series of minesweepers. And that's it. <laughs> That's all the preparation done. It's only taken three episodes of thinking, designing, planning, prioritizing to get here. Obviously, in your own game, this would be a lot shorter process. I've I've drawn it out in order to show you a comprehensive example of thinking about everything in every way. All we have to do now is uh, press my well, press save is press the big turn button and go. And that's exactly what we're going to do in our next episode. See you then.